So uh, this afternoon, we're, we're joined by artists Lillian garcia Roig, uh, who's in Tallahassee, Florida. Hi, Lillian. We're very thrilled to have you visit with us. Um, we are in the midst of a, vin a small vignette exhibition from our permanent collection called um, From Then to Now, She Says. And we are in the midst of a study of our collection. So Lillian, we want to kind of uh, hear from you and visit with you about your um, life as an artist, about your process and kind of uh, your trajectory because you and I have had a couple of conversations and I'm, I'm infinitely interested in the um, decisions that artists make and what they're based on. Um, so having received your BFA from Southern Methodist University, if I um, had made different choices in life, I would have been there right when you were there. Oh, so no. yet wow. again, another regret in my life, <laughs> but I missed you by a year. I think I would have um, been there in uh, 87 and you received your degree in 88. Mm -hmm. um, and then you went on to get your MFA at the Pennsylvania, the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. what, what an incredible program. Uh, you talked a lot about, um, you know, kind of being the only Latina in the room and realizing that you were mining the depths of, you know, what it meant to be uh, you in the world of art and uh, how you could um, exist and, and delve into that which was uh, the most uh, undeniable part of you. And, and yet it took you a while to get there, right? So having been born in Cuba in what was that, 68? 66. Okay, and came to Texas in 1968? No, we, um... The, the way people who left Cuba towards the end of that first wave, uh, often they would either go to Mexico City or Spain for a little bit to get the paperwork done. So we actually left in late 68, went to Spain for two years. But at that time, Franco was still in power. So there was this, you know, fascist, scary person. And my parents were like, well, let's, um, let's not chance having to leave again. You know, or, or, you know, mm -hmm. so we came to the U.S really late in 1970. Okay. And we ended up moving to Texas um, in late 70. Um, I learned to speak English in San Antonio, Texas. So I like to say I've lived in all the major cities because I have. I learned to speak Spanish in San Antonio. I went to a preschool there. And then we moved to Houston um, either in 71 or 72. Um, and that's where I went to public school all through graduated um, you know, from St. Agnes Academy in Houston, because the, although I went to the Vanguard programs that were great at that point, they didn't have a high school. They opened one up the year after I graduated. That was a magnet school, which was a bit unfortunate, but um, yeah. And then I went off to college in Dallas and then I went to graduate school for two years, but then I got a job right out of graduate school in Austin at UT Austin. So, you know, I lived there 10 years. Yeah. So really it's, you know, San Antonio, Houston, uh, Dallas, and Austin. Um, right. Yeah. And then there was Berkeley, and now there's Tallahassee, and right. in between there was Washington State, and, and I love the presentation that you pulled together for us because it really shows kind of your trajectory in terms of sites and being in the landscape, and, and I'd love to visit with you about all of those experiences because it was quite evolutionary, as well as your um, the influences on your life, mm -hmm. um, both directly and, and kind of uh, self-proclaimed. Um, so this whole notion of being uh, a hyphenated artist, I find that infinitely interesting. I'd like to share the screen with you now if we can and start uh, to delve into this. Um, let's see. And I think one thing that uh, Texans will uh, appreciate in particular is that being a Cuban in Texas was was kind of odd in a way because, you know, things like tortilla is very different if you're Mexican than if you're Cuban, what a tortilla is. So, um, you know, little things like that where you realize kind of the breadth of diversity within 
the kind of Latin American community um, and even in Texas um, was really fascinating to me to kind of learn about all the you know variations on Latinidad, Latinidad you know, if nothing else. So, absolutely. Um, are you seeing the full screen now? Mm -hmm. I am. Uh, great. And thank you once again for preparing this. Um, behind me and on the screen now is Layered View. And this is a painting that we acquired in our collection, I believe in 08. And I think you completed it in 07, is that right? It was either 07 or 06, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. Um, but it, it was at least a year, if not two before that, usually takes, up, it takes a year for things to dry. <laughs> and so this series is one that um, came together as a result of what? Yeah. So what happened was um, I actually used to be, so I guess the, these, these next slides, if you want to kind of move through them, these are uh, the, okay, so there you can see this installation. I, I, at the time, I didn't have a camera that could actually kind of uh, put these together, but I always had wanted to do an installation sort of montage, um, but in, in able, you know, to be able to do that, I needed to be at a place for a long time. And uh, Washington State, is a place that in the summer one can actually work pretty well in. And I uh, saved up some money to drive across the country and just work all summer in Washington. And I did that for two years. So I had enough works that were the same size that I realized, wow, you know, more can be more. I really wanna do this kind of um, a montage. And I had, I don't know how many were the four foot high ones, uh, but I had on the back wall I had um, some that, that were actually this size, five, uh, five feet. Now these happen to be from McDowell, but the, the piece that you have came from the first ever larger, and what I mean by larger is four by three and five by three foot on-site paintings. And this is kind of important because um, probably your audience will, will notice that, you know, when the impressionists, you know, started doing work, you know, the, the big deal was the invention of the tube of paint that you can then take outside, you know, small tubes of paint and work outside. And a lot of artists, even if they were working wet on wet in a quick way, they would work fairly small. And that's the more traditional format is a fairly small size, right? Or if you're going to work bigger, you're doing much looser strokes, right? right? So I wanted to have more specificity and more scale. And it took me quite a long time to kind of build up to this four by three foot format. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, these are examples. These are five, uh, three of the four by five foot high ones uh, that I that I turned into a triptych um, at McDowell. Um, I go to residencies. I try to go to residencies where I can actually drive around in my truck and find spots to paint. Um, and these are uh, you know examples of the first some of the first larger ones. So here's here's a standalone piece, and. I think let's see the next one is a detail of this piece. So what I like about this this kind of grouping here in terms of an illustration of my work is is I want my work to seem surprisingly different when it's up close. Really like you know you're aware of the materiality of the paint and the process that yeah you're almost going wow that can't possibly work but like if you go backwards right. you see that it holds together as one piece and then I kind of complicate it even more if you go backwards a bit more I'll find formal relationships from non-contiguous spaces that I find interesting because it's a way to reinforce not just that they're not win you know they're not windows into nature. I mean, you can't compete with nature, right? Nature is nature. These are paintings. But I do want you to understand that it's this specific birch with its specific characteristics. Um, but then you can jump into the other view because there's this maybe diagonal, and then all of a sudden you're in a different space. And I find that this um, this kind of forcing the viewer to kind of jump into space is really more like how we experience nature anyway. So I do that within each painting on its own, but then with these triptychs, I said I complicate that even more. Right, so, the, the incremental shift that we take in nature that you take as an artist mm -hmm. is also a part of that layering. Mm -hmm. um, so even the texture that you're creating is, is kind of setting up a, a, an impasto situation that yeah. is very physical. So Joan Mitchell, this is an artist who may not have worked as thickly, yeah. but she certainly worked as energetically. Uh, she was an influence, eh? A huge influence. And, um, you know, not that I was trying to um, 
you know, make work like her, but I admired the muscularity of the work. Um, and of course, you know, you can think of de Kooning as well. Um, but often word like muscularity is associated with kind of male artists, right? And I saw her work as being, you know, very forceful in a way I liked and I, you know, I admired, you know, she, she wasn't scared of, you know, doing this and, and moving things around. And so, although I, I, you know, her work is definitely more abstracted than mine is. Um, and, I, and I think this is an important slide because this was in the 80s when I was in, in, in college, what I, when I discovered Lucian uh, Freud on the left and then more maybe importantly, Frank Auerbach on the right, I thought that was an interesting thing because, you know, and you can include Joan Mitchell in this mix, right, with that kind of intensity of stroke. But I really wanted to have as much specificity as I could, maybe more like a Freud, but with that image emerging out of paint thing that uh, Auerbach had. Right. And I throw, I throw these in here because I, I, I tell this to students, because this was what I used to do in high school. Uh, the, the image on the left, the glasses, that was the very first drawing I ever did when I discovered that pencils existed in more than just that 2B. So I set up two glasses, two pairs of glasses I had on my dad's desk and I put a light on it and I started drawing them. And uh, the one on the right is a drawing I did from a life drawing class that I took, um, not, not in high school, this was a separate thing on, on the weekend. Um, but you know, I learned that you can really use everything from a 9H to a 9B, and I would use, you know, kneaded erasers in a very kind of technical way. So I think that it's important to learn the technical aspects of things before, you know, know the rules before you break the rules. And so yeah. I do think it's, I think this will make sense kind of moving down the line that sometimes people will ask me if we go to the next slide. Um, I think there's some influences here. Um, well, this is kind of Roger Winter, but people often will go, you know, how do you get away with that? And I'm like, well, because I know the rules and I know when I've gone too far and I'm losing it, I know, you know, the certain things I need to kind of pull back. So Roger Winter was a big influence uh, when I was at SMU. And one thing I always loved about his work was it was both specific, but had a type of stroke that showed. Now, I personally, if you want to go back to, to that painting, because this was a painting I remember seeing uh, the uh, Roger's work on. Um, I remember seeing this, this at the faculty show. And I wanted so badly to take a tube of paint and just make one big squeeze mark across like that lighter area. Right. Roger was very regular, right? So they were still strokes, but they were very regular. And I don't know why I've always wanted irregularity. He said, and I think it comes back to this sort of, I want to push the boundaries where they, they shouldn't work, but they somehow do. So a type of illogical logic, maybe. Sure. Or, um, so let's go to the next one. So the next one is an example of the very first painting I did um, at Skowhegan that was a tree. Um, I had been a figurative painter before, and here's another example of a Skowhegan piece. Now these are eight, 24 by 18. So while they're not super, super small, this was the size that I was doing, um, which is fairly traditional plein air. And what I would do is, is, is I, I would build a bunch of the stretchers beforehand. And then I got to the point where like I'd go in the morning and work for three to four hours. And then I'd take another canvas out if I could in the middle of the day and went in the afternoon. Sometimes there were just two of them, but um, so I would just kind of do them. sitting in a single moment. A single you're sitting. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have like one of those little portable easels. I just took the easel and propped it up on a rocker or whatever. And I had my palette on the ground and, and I didn't want to really overthink them, but I worked very overall. And so there was always this idea of the passage of time. Sure. Um, let's go to the, uh, yeah. So, so um, I think it's important to, to, to mention that when I went to um, Penn, the professor, the main professor there, the only professor honestly was, was uh, Neil Welliver and Roger Winter had wanted me to go to the University of Pennsylvania and work with Neil Welliver. And he, there's a quote uh, that I, I remind him that he remembers that was, he said, you need to go to there because you know, you'll be, he'll be good for you and you'll be good for him, whatever that meant. <laughs> um, and, and I think what ended up happening was it was because, so, so Neil had a house in Maine and he painted a lot of things in Maine, but he paints very differently than I do. He would go and do a bunch of little studies and then he would make what he thought was the idealized version of it basically then draw it out and then kind of fill it in so he became known as the kind of paint by numbers artist oh, sure so there was a lot of sort of this kind of logical thinking through and understanding and then doing whereas 
I wanted to just be in like the chaotic moment of experiencing and Dashing figuring it, it out. Yeah, yeah. As, as I went, like I did not want to ever do an outline. So these are some examples of Texas paintings. Um, so, so people ask me a lot, well, do you do an underpainting? I'm like, no, I don't do an underpainting. You know, I just, I start and I respond. And, and if there's a bird, I look up, um, you know, sometimes what happens is I don't notice something or something's a different color at first. And then when it becomes either needed in the painting or just so interesting that I notice it, that's when it gets introduced into the painting. So these are a few more um, from Texas. In Texas, uh, at one point I was able to paint at Lost Maple State, uh, close to Lost Maple State Park on a private um, 4,000 acre property, which was great yeah. that I could just drive around and really spend time out. And I would and try to go there. A place in, that in really the goes up and down and it has these kind of dry river beds, right? Yeah, I mean, it is an amazing part of Texas. And this particular place has these natural maple trees that are indigenous to Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, they, and they can grow there because they're growing in these valleys that are fairly narrow, so they don't get beaten down by the sun like they would in yeah. most parts of Texas. And this is kind of, you know, another way of breaking out of that kind of grid. There's no rigidity in here, but when we look at your influences, you're looking at intensity, right? Intensity of light, of color. Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting because I, I put, I like sometimes mentioning Frederick Church and I have other examples, um, you know, Beardstad and, and, and even sometimes I'll talk about the highwaymen, right? Um, because my work, while um, influenced in some ways by these amazing romantic scenes, I'm not trying to make a romantic painting you know, maybe in a way it's, it's not quite the antithesis. I think, I think my work's a lot more like an Emily Carr, but if there are these, but there is, I think deep down, and this is why maybe I had a lot of John Muir quotes earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I do find that in nature is where I feel the most connected. And so I think that that's something, you know, Church was doing in his way, maybe in, in what we call a more romanticized way. Mine maybe has more of an element of, or, or wants to leave the element of the struggle to make a connection. And um, Emily Carr um, has, is an artist that I really related to as well. So that whole notion of uh, kind of the, the hyphenated identity, you're finding in these landscapes something that you can identify and sort of extrapolate, right? And yeah, I think that I think that there's two things with the hyphenated. There's the formal hyphenation of wanting something that is both realistic and has this illusion, right? Illusionistic possibility of what painting can give you, right? A, a illusion of space, illusion of a type of tree, a pine versus something else. But I want the reality of it being paint and process. Um, and so that formal hyphenation, I didn't realize how much in a way I was kind of fighting to try to hyphenate maybe my own aesthetics. Because uh, one of the things you were alluding to is, you know, I didn't realize what me being an immigrant um, and not ever really fully feeling like I was mainstream. I mean, I wanted, you know, I was trying to assimilate my hardest. Um, I mean, I went to SME for goodness sakes, you know, but um, but I always did feel like, you know, I didn't quite belong, but yet I was getting things out of my experience there. And, 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 and I was naturally fighting against this less is more, right? And also ideas of using less color or, you know, be more abstract or more realistic. Like they didn't want me to be both. And um, so this is the painting that, that you all have. And this one was done in the foothills of the Cascades Mountains in Washington state. And the reason it's so overly green is, um, you know, for those of you that have been there, it is basically green on green on green on green. It is lush and lush and green. And it's actually rather difficult to pull out the various um, types of trees and things because, you know, you don't have that much variety in color and form necessarily, right? So I found it a, a really kind of wonderful challenge because in, in this particular painting, you know, I can identify each of those trees and you know, everything that, that's, that's there. And, and I love it, especially when people 
who have been to these places I paint mm -hmm. relate to them and understand very much what they are. So yeah. forgive me for leaping yeah. forward. Well, no, and this is yeah. one of the one of the many qualities that we marvel at with this painting is the whole idea of you know there is no end. Uh, there is sort of, uh, of course, there's a beginning, but it's so enmeshed in being truly layered that the sweep of action just takes you into another action. So it's it's an incredible experience to stand in front of this picture. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I like to talk about that in some ways as a perceptual experience, right? That that, that my paintings aren't um, they make you work, right? Yeah. They make you focus in and out, or physically, you know, move back and move forward, and um, and I like works like that. It's very um, active from yeah. the viewer's point of view, for sure. And, and so Charles Birchfield, I love the structure of his watercolors. Um, and I can see how this would have appealed to you. And yet it's very unlike you as well. It's quite structural. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, an, he's an artist who I admire and look to, but don't, like you say, really mimic necessarily but it's this sense of both the marks representing more than the marks in his case more spirituality sure. you know i love how you know in the, in the tree on the right you know the little dots represent something beyond the treeness right and i don't need any more definition on the other tree coming in from the side because i understand it enough so it's this beautiful balance of enough specificity of the subject with this other feeling of engagement right on his part it was this intense spirituality sure. um, that comes through. Um, so yeah, our works maybe formally look different, but I think they're trying to do d similar things. And, and I've always loved this little Van Gogh painting yeah. um, of trees. Um, of course, Van Gogh is someone who the marks are something I've always admired. Mm -hmm. And they're impasto quality, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so your finger is a tool. <laughs> Light is all around you, and yet you're you're going back in and moving it around again. Um, yeah, and this and this image is is fun because, as you can see, the painting it's a little might be a little hard to see, but you can see the top edge of the painting right above my finger. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't use my fingers at the beginning of the paintings, but what happens is I start with the brushes and I start thinner for the most part, especially if it's a color that I see that needs to be translucent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is my palette, um, which um, Richard Schiff wrote an essay about my work once and asked me when he was, you know, be before he wrote it, how many colors I used. And, and, I, and I really was pretty sure it might've been 30 to 40. And when I counted, I was shocked that it was 65 <laughs> when I counted them, which um, I tell, you know, that's way too many pigments, but it's because I need to be able to work very quickly and if you go to the next slide, I think it shows my, there we go. So there you can kind of see that I have brushes out, you know, I mix some things, but the, the image on the right is one of my multiple boxes that I um, have of colors that I mix on site that are specific colors of these, you know, weird browns and purpley taupe colors and things that you can't buy a pigment of, right? That you right. have to mix that are specific to that place and I put them back in tubes so that if we go back to the finger painting, mm -hmm. as you know, because I'm painting over the course of many hours, when, you know, in the morning things look a certain way and it might be like there's a shape that I put in that's dark and the only way you can put like a lighter wet color over a darker color is either to scrape it off or be thicker and so the finger allows you to put a mark without lifting up the color underneath more than a brush can. But then I discovered that sometimes that's not enough. I want a really thick stroke. And so that's where the tubes come in, that if I see a color that's like a light taupey color and I need to put a very big line, I will, you know, pick up the color I mixed for that very occasion. And so the paintings really stay open and, and they can stay kind of maybe more like a drawing in that way with the tubes. So I kind of draw with the tubes. Yeah. Um, but I also have these very specific colors that I can put over wet, darker colors if needed. 
And so you're literally going out with everything in tow yeah. so that you are at the ready. And yeah. how, you're in this atmosphere for changing light, changing conditions. Mm -hmm. And how do you handle, it looks like you've set up a system where you can keep them separate from one another so that that wetness doesn't get right i mean with you know as with all on-site painters you have to be able to bring back your your work or if it starts raining you have to be able to pack up and so you probably have seen some of these easels that have very small canvases that are thin that kind of slide in the top after you're done with your one little work mm -hmm. well i mean i want to work that that's a canvas that's four feet by five feet and so clearly you know that traditional way isn't going to work so i have a full-size easel um, my truck's full of, you can see all those little red um, containers. Yeah. That's just some of them. My, the whole bottom of my truck has even more because, um, you know, in case, not that I use them all, but in case I need to be prepared. And then I built a system. It's kind of like a pie rack where I can slide yeah, the painting in. Mm -hmm. I have to, and that's how I transport the paintings. I have a trailer that has a similar system. Yeah, so this is an example of another painting I did when I was at McDowell. Uh, I love this painting in yeah. that it has so much abstraction within it and it almost has this kind of symbolism that you're really mm -hmm. having fun with the way light and color are reacting to one another. Yeah, this one, this one reminds me a little bit of maybe, um, you know, Birchfield or Carr, right? A little bit of that. But what happened with that circle at the top, that was one of the last things I did. But as, as I'm painting, you know, you can imagine that you know things are changing so at first the tree like that main tree didn't have that lighter blob on on that left side um, and all of a sudden light started hitting this painting differently and i noticed different things and i made that round circle on top because i looked up and i noticed a circular grouping now of lighter yellow and i didn't mean to leave it a circle right it's a gesture right it's like the beginning i thought you know because i every mark i make i don't know if it's going to be a mark I keep I just I think in a cumulative way mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I looked up and I said wow it's done like it I don't need to you know break it up I mean that makes sense and then by having that it allowed me to leave a lot more of the white I know that you were interested in some of the white um I think I have a detail I don't know if there's much white on the detail but yeah you can actually see quite a bit of white sure. to on um, towards the right hand side of that um, and so it hit this like balance. All of a sudden I recognized something that the painting was telling me that it was done. So oftentimes people ask me when I know something is done. And I always answer, I don't know when something is done, but I know when it's not done. Yeah. Right. Because there isn't one answer. I mean, I, yeah, I keep saying this, but I can't compete with nature. Right. I'm not trying to replicate nature. I'm having an experience in nature and I'm trying to translate not just what I see, but how I feel about in my struggle of trying to capture things. And so, you know, I'll look up and go, wow, that looks like what I'm experiencing. You're responsive to the atmosphere. You're responsive to the work that you're producing mm -hmm. and you're allowing that to, to speak back. Mm -hmm. You had told me earlier that, you know, you're not necessarily composing the whole installation until later, right? Mm -hmm. Now this one, uh, this was one of the first, this is actually, I, I didn't include the, uh, the original nine panel piece, but um, sometimes when I'm invited to museums, um, especially if I have some time out, like if it's a solo show and um, I like to see the space and think about if I can make a work that relates not just to that place, but maybe even to the space. And uh, the piece that is being looked at, the one that looks like sort of a, a natural cross, right? Like a mother nature altar piece, um, is five of the original nine pieces I had made for a show at the Chopo Museum that had a very kind of vertical space. And I wanted to, to use Florida vegetation that was kind of similar to what you might find in Mexico, but kind of pay homage to the pyramid, but also to the space. And I'd never made paintings that were vertically stacked. I'd always made these kind of diptychs and installations where right, but um, it wasn't vertical because you get a sharp cut. 
And I really wanted to make something vertical. So I did have to think about, well, what would that be? You know, if I'm going to make something and I still want to have unexpected things, what are the, and, um, you know, what, are, what would I want to use? And in that case, I wanted to use the three main trees that were found all over the different zones of Florida, because Florida has everything from tropical to yeah. where I am, where things freeze, right? So you have a right. cypress tree, you have a live oak tree, and you have the sable palm, that's a state tree. Um, and they're found everywhere. So I kind of wanted to figure out how to make that um, a unit. So that was the first vertical piece. And then the next one, um, I got to spend a few weeks, actually, I guess three weeks total, uh, working down at the Ringling campus in Sarasota. And I've always wanted to paint banyan trees. I've been fascinated by them, but I've never lived anywhere where they grow, right? Because they're tropical. So in Sarasota, they happen to have 13 of these huge banyan trees um, that um, apparently Thomas Edison gave John Ringling uh, for his state. So I was able to be there like an artist in residence and just paint a bunch of paintings with the idea of making a work that would be of a scale that would be slightly bigger than Rubens because the Ringling Museum, if, if anyone's ever been down there, um, one of the things that they actually um, are known for are these, I, I believe they have eight of these large Ruben paintings that were cr created. They're a little looser than his normal paintings, but they were created to make big tapestries. So they're huge. And they're figurative? And, yeah. Yeah. Well, so this particular a show, they invited us, they invited some artists to respond to things in the Ringling collection through a contemporary lens. And so that particular uh, painting, I was kind of referencing, of, of course, Rubens, but I was also referencing their, um, they have a wonderful David Hockney uh, photo collage and they have uh, Joseph Albers uh, series of his work. And so I wanted to do kind of the, the Hockney multiple piece thing. Um, but the banyans were pretty important because not just as as an image that are complicated but also just metaphorically sure i've always liked the banyans in terms of how it's one tree that then has the aerial roots and just keeps creating this bigger and bigger community um and it was very yeah. much like a like a vascular system you know something that's so interconnected it was almost like it was a singular body but it had all these different aspects to it. Um, I was actually looking for that installation at Ringling. I'm sorry I jumped forward. Wait, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. Yeah, so that, those are just little details. Um, I mean, these happen to be images I put in here because people often, um, when I talk about perceptually active work, I like talking about Chuck Close's work. Um, I, you know, the photo real stuff was, was impressive and it was fine, but it wasn't until he started doing these works, right? After his post aneurysm work, um, where I really just thought, oh my gosh, because if you've ever seen these in real life, they're very large. Yeah. And, you, and when you see them from 50 feet away, you know, they look like you're squinting and pretty realistic. Mm -hmm. um, but when you get close, it's this hot mess, right? It's just yes. beautiful that that works. And so yeah. I am, I'm showing you a detail of uh, bottom part of one of my paintings on the right and mine's very much like a hot mess like it doesn't look very ordered at all and let's go to the next one um yeah well so um so so one of the things um that may not be evident is is that Chuck Close works from photographs so he takes the photographs and breaks them down and kind of turns them into these little uh color theory moments right that meld together to make sense but I'm not working from a, uh, an image that doesn't move. I'm working from something that's actually changing, right? So I'm trying to get this perceptually active painting, but I'm doing it from a perceptually active subject. So although I think a lot about color theory and I've taken a lot of color theory, I'm not trying to distill it down to this. I'm not working from said something that's static, like a photograph, um, but I do want something kind of like what I experienced with Chuck Close's work. Well, you had kind of started early on figuratively, and mm -hmm. you had said to me that you realized once you started looking at landscape and being in the landscape, that it had so much more to offer, that it had so much more um, complexity, right? Yeah, and, and what I mean by more to offer is that, um, 
This is, I, I like this because people don't think of Klimt as a, a landscape artist, but I love this kind of, again, kind of the, the, the play of flatness and, and specificity. Um, the, what I found more useful to me with the landscape was with a figure, you can only distort or exaggerate so much before it looks distorted or exaggerated, unless you get so, so, so big, right? You, you do the whole huge thing. But even then, you know, if you put a nose over here, we all know that the nose should not be over here. Whereas with landscape, I realized that you can really have a blob of paint that can seem to be a mile away and at the same time, maybe depending on what you're focusing on or how far away you are from the painting can be jump right off that, literally jump off the surface. Mm -hmm. And it's made sense because landscape has more space, right? And the organic landscape in particular allows us to really um, have that figure ground interchange really, um, occur at a more heightened unexpected level. So, so that's really what the landscape allowed me to do is it allowed me to formally really play with the figure in the ground in a way that, that, that the figure itself didn't quite do until it went then into this distortion mode. And I think also when one looks at and through something, you're not looking at something necessarily uh, on the surface. In this case, you're actually looking through a shape to another shape to another shape and the body would sort of stop you. You might be looking at the volume of something or the fold of something, but that's fairly finite, right? Yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, I, I have uh, painted actually a series of that piece on, this is a diptych, so the, the painting of the tree on the right whenever I go to Washington, I always paint that tree. And I must have painted this tree 15 times. And it always looks both the same and different, right? Um, even if I stand in the exact same place, something's different. The light, you know, so it will never be the same painting. And so, so much of what is included in a painting is based on the previous mark, right? And it goes back to this idea of an image emerging out of paint mm -hmm. and my desire to have an overallness, right? To have the whole thing feel right as a whole. So there's not, so this is a detail of that. I mean, I couldn't have predicted I was going to make that green blobby thing. Um, and I probably in my mind, even after I did it, was totally thinking I might make that more specific, but I may not need to. And the thing is, I don't know if that's the case until I know it's not the case anymore. So it's, it's a weird kind of counterintuitive thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I do like to show people who are very purely abstract because I love this type of work too. I, I just don't do work that's like yeah. this, except I do things like this work. Absolutely. In, that um, I what you're in looking anyway. at and through and what resonates is sometimes that pop of what, is it the furthest back? Is it the close, closest mm -hmm. to the surface? Yeah. This is the installation I was trying to get to at Ringling. And I love that everybody has their own voice in this, a, a different way of looking at whatever their prompt was. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so um, I had mentioned that this particular show, we were invited to um, five artists. This is just one of the rooms. It was another room with another two artists. Um, and Judy had a piece, Judy uh, Russian has a piece in the middle and she had another piece in the room. But we were invited to, you said make work, that somehow was inspired by work in the Ringling's uh, collection. And one of the things that the Ringling is known for is the circus. So some of the artists, uh, you know, took cues from that. Um, Judy was very interested in uh, the compartmentalization or, or how the breakdown of the circus, right? And then also the costumes and took a lot of color samples. And, and I thought this was really a wonderful um, grouping because I'm fascinated by color theory and Joseph Albers, it's just that in my work, it's not reductivist, it's, it's a maximalist way to think about color and balance. Mm -hmm. Whereas she's a very reductivist person. And yet I think in this installation, you really see how all our work kind of talks to one another. And then Mark Messersmith on the right, he's another colleague of mine whose work I, I really, really admire. And, and he's interesting because, um, well, if he's interesting for many reasons, but I joke with him because his work in a way is very traditional and, and 
like he paints the way you're supposed to. He ties things together by using the rules and all those things. And I'm always trying to said break as many rules and still get it right. And then Judy's really um, distilling things mm -hmm. to their essence, right? Um, and yet, clearly, we're all painters absolutely. that love painting. It's and really painting. singing. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Yeah, and so just so people these again. Yeah, these yeah. were in the back of the gallery, right? Yeah, and that and that painting ended up being, um, I believe, it was fourteen feet by twenty feet. And so I, I like showing this because when you walk closely, you can see some of the um, the edges where the, the different paintings meet. And I like to talk about um, I, mean, I talk about discovery a lot with my on site work. You know, I like to be there and just see what I try to capture what I can from nature right in my kind of flawed way but so piecing things together allows me to discover even newer places or even newer spaces that weren't even in nature right it's like my painting so I like this kind of center area that's a new space that I've discovered yes. by an accidental I mean I don't force these things I discover them and so I move, I decide what can work with something else based on if there's enough formal connections, but I get very excited about these edges and margins. And, and the more I think about hyphenation and also immigration, um, you know, I do think that the Banyans and, and this multiple piece is a good example of how you put things that shouldn't belong together and you find new spaces that are exciting, right? So you wouldn't have had this new space had these two things that shouldn't go together or you didn't think could go together actually went together. That's so, great. That's yeah. great. So it's conceptual and formal and yet it has such uh, visual impact. I mean, the family of color is pulling it together. The energy of the strokes are pulling it together and yet they could exist on their own, right? And each painting, I think, I think the next, yeah. So this is an example of one of the 15 panels in that big Banyan piece. And every time I make a work, like the one I made, the one you guys have, that's a standalone painting. Every painting I make is a standalone painting. But then I see if I can group it up with other things. So here are three of those paintings from the original Banyan piece that I then turned into a triptych. Yeah. I didn't repaint anything. Those are just now reshuffled. So it's like a deck of cards that I can make different kind of winning hands, let's say, with a couple different yeah. um, things. And then well, here, this yeah. is another great <laughs> example of art yeah. coexisting, right? The, the worminess of uh, Dale Chihuly hovering above your installation. Yeah, and what's funny is that the uh, curator um, of, the, of the Baker Museum, where this is at, I was invited to be in the Florida um, Contemporary Show. She told me that many artists really don't like being in this gallery because the Chihuly is so strong of a piece that they kind of fear it. And I was like, oh, but I love it. <laughs> I'm like, bring it on. I was so excited to be in the Chihuly room. Um, but one was thing- Was this a result of a residency? No, uh, she had seen my work. Uh, before and wanted to include me in the show. Now, now, what's interesting though, is if you notice that the walls here, these are actually all the 15 pieces from the original one at the Ringling, but because their walls were only whatever it was, 11 feet or 12 feet, what I did is I reconfigured the pieces for another way. And then I took the five that didn't fit and made them their own little grouping. So, um, they function uh, in yeah. a different way, mm -hmm. and yet the energy is still kind of uh, playing off each panel. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. So uh, are we in Cuba now? Yeah, so um, for if people are wondering, you know, uh, what else do I do or, or, or what other maybe directions have I taken, um, I have wanted to be able to work in Cuba as an on-site painter because part of what I've realized um, over time is that as I've traveled across the country to different places to paint, I think one of the reasons I do that is, is to connect to place. And it's because I feel a little displaced. Um, you know, when people ask me where I'm from, I always respond, do you mean where I was born, where I grew up, or where I live now? Because I was born in Cuba, but I grew up in Texas. I mean, I lived in Texas 30 years you know, basically from age five to 35. I mean, that's, you know, that 
I'm a Texan, right? Um, but I live in Florida now, but I don't live in Miami. I live in Tallahassee, so it's complicated. So I say all this because I do have a, a sense of wanting to belong, right? And, and I realize that maybe me spending time looking at things that aren't that um, spectacular, right? Not the view, but just a place that seems simple is my way of kind of claiming space and saying, yeah, I'm from here, at least from now, for these two or three days, I'm from here. I, you know, I have a relationship with this space that maybe no one else has or will ever have because it's going to change. And with the Cuba work, I've been wanting to be able to work in Cuba, but because of all the various um, logistical reasons, um, and also because I left as early as I did, I can't go to Cuba whenever I want. It's a big complicated process for me to go. Um, but I was finally able to work for two weeks there. And I went to Pinar de Rio. I'd done a lot of research on Cuban landscape painters um, and their on-site practice. And the Pinar de Rio area is uh, the most recognizable part of Cuba. And it's also the place that has, I guess, the biggest history of landscape painting. And so I went there and did my own little on-site work but because I couldn't take oil paintings and I knew I couldn't paint the way I normally did, what I ended up using was um, watercolor paper and acrylic paints. And so they look more watercolory because um, I do believe in whatever material I use, I should take advantage of what it can do. And because I was working with paper, mm -hmm. you can thin out acrylics to make them look like watercolor. So I love the idea of, of um, and I guess if you wanna go back, you can see a few more of them. Um, yeah, I love the idea of, of letting some of them just be more watery, right? And some of them do different things. There is a little diptych there in the middle. Um, but if you go back to the next one, uh, that, yeah, that you can see that I also did make little tubes. No, I, the, the Cuba one. I did also kind of buy little tubes and fill them with specific colors as well, you know, to have a little bit of my squeezing out of, of the tubes as, as well. Yeah, um, the physicality of that was still mm -hmm. possible. Uh, went working on paper with your acrylics. Mm -hmm. I love how this has that kind of muscularity that you were talking about, mm -hmm. but it also has this really kind of tender, like tiny detail mm -hmm. that you're really present, you're really noticing, and you're using the elements of, you know, kind of the, the magnitude of the rock face, but also mm -hmm. the specificity of the vegetation. These are really a beautiful <laughs> series, right? Yeah, okay. and well, yeah. so so one thing, because I was only in Cuba for two weeks, um, I had this big, um, maybe existential question of, you know, how can I, or can I even, as an on-site painter, I mean, that's kind of how I've described myself and, you know, how I've really kind of built my visual career on being a person who goes somewhere and perceptually experiences things. How can I make work about Cuba? if I'm no longer in Cuba and can I? And I, you know, I had thought about this question before I went. And so before I left, I purposely took a bunch of soil from Cuba, uh, knowing that you, know, you can use different things to turn them into, in, into pigments. And so when I came back, I, I was at the residency at the Joan Mitchell Center in New Orleans. And I thought, well, you know, this is a fairly short residency. And part of their goal is to experience the other artists and kind of be in this wonderful studio. So I didn't want to just spend all my time painting in New Orleans. Like, you know, I really wanted to try to do something in the studio. And this was a month after I'd returned from Cuba. And I tried to repaint some of my paintings, you know, some of the little paintings on a bigger scale. And I, and I was like, you know, that doesn't interest me. I don't want to, you know, that didn't make sense. And when I started using the Cuban dirt, all of a sudden it, it I was like, I can now repaint my paintings or even, you know, um, look at photographs I took or old paintings and repaint them using this dirt because by using the literal Cuban landscape, yeah. I felt that then I could play with it. And then what that let me do too is, is I was thinking about this idea of hyphenation and, and in a way maybe reconciliation of my kind of modernist Bauhausian upbringing yeah. that I always wanted to, like, I, I don't like Symmetry. I like asymmetry. I like asymmetrical balance versus symmetrical balance. Right. I was always trying to break the grid, but I love 
color theory, right? But I hate the grid, but you know, it's not that I didn't like Agnes Martin. I love her work, but I like the imperfections in the work, right? So it let me play with this idea of using, in this case, actually, if you go back to the one before, what I was using, or the, the one before that, is I was using the colors of the Pinar de Rio Valley of the houses, because those of you that have gone to the Caribbean, um, mm -hmm. or even New Orleans, you've noticed that um, Latinos really like colorful houses. It's a thing, right? Especially in the Caribbean, people have very brightly colored houses. And so I found that I was taking pictures of these brightly colored houses. And so I, I pulled colors from the houses as my squares. And then I used the Cuban dirt to paint the landscape. And so if you go to the next one, you know, you, you saw the, the dirt and some of the, the colors. I was also looking at um, uh, architectural things because uh, some of these were architectural images. But the larger ones, I did another series kind of based on, on that similar thing. Let's see what the next one is. Uh, and then, um, and, and one thing I'm playing with now is I'm still doing that series, but I'm still working on site and I'm kind of playing around with this idea of hyphenating these two works. Can I even hyphenate the non on site works with the on site works? Um, so let's see the next one. I think there's another example of this coming up. Yeah. So, um, so this is a slight different variation instead of painting the Cuban landscape. Another thing I was thinking about is, you know, this idea of maybe lost connection or history. And what I mean by that is, is, you know, there's lots of immigrants in this country, but most people who immigrate can go back and visit their country whenever they want. I actually can't. I said it's a big process. And, and I've only been able to go back to Cuba five times in my life. And I'm like 54 years old. So for many years, I was not allowed to go back. So the first time I went back to Cuba in 1999, I, I didn't realize the loss that I felt when I went there because I didn't think I had lost anything. I was too young to remember Cuba, right? So this idea of connecting, like, you know, connecting to the history that I would have been part of had I been there. And so this one, what I did is instead of pulling, pulling colors from the houses that were specifically from the Pinar de Rio Valley that I went to, is I pulled colors from these two paintings that I had painted in Florida. And then I repainted a painting of, uh, that's in the uh, museum in Havana, a very famous um, landscape painter called Carta. Uh, this is one of my favorite paintings when I went to the museum there. And so I repainted that painting with Cuban dirt. But the squares are based on said colors from my paintings. And so it's, it's my way of trying to set hyphenate the history I don't really have, but kind of have with the, the real experience that, that I'm living. And it does very much communicate that kind of um, melding and taking from, in your case, maybe your past and your, your current um, knowledge and experience. Uh, it, it functions really beautifully. So I wanted to show and share your, your thoughtful system <laughs> Because you've got to make a plan, right, to get out there and... Yeah, um, I do. And when I go on my, like, depending on how long the painting trip is, the, the truck, the, the image on the right, actually, is I was taking a bunch of water paintings. I had, I had two summers ago, I spent the, uh, a month or maybe six weeks painting in Washington, and I focused on running water. I didn't show you any of those because that's a whole nother <laughs> bottle of wax, but this is me driving a bunch of paintings to Dallas. But when I'm working on site too, you can imagine I, I, I can pull, you know, I can push it in there. Um, and the trailer shows um, when I have kind of bigger shows, like when I had the, um, the Ringling show, mm -hmm. uh, I needed the trailer. So I, I do have to, this is something I tell students, think about how you're gonna move the work around, how you're gonna ship it. You know, if you're working in your studio or outside, then what when you're done, right? So um, this is my then what. It's your what? It's my then what do you do after you're oh, done? Oh, there you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually, you know, my studio, uh, a little glimpse of, of my studio. Um, I really don't, used to not do much work other than when I bring the work from outside, then I'll stare at them for a long time and maybe kind of do a dot or two. Um, but the Cuba work, I can do that in here. Um, but I guess after the slideshow, if you want, I, I can kind of show a few things in there. So this is a pretty typical Florida 
central North Florida scene. This is a diptych. And this is more, this, this, this one could be Texas because this really is basically pine trees and oaks and vines, that Mustang vine that grows everywhere. So although it's yeah. Northern Florida, right. you know, it could have been Texas. Incredible. So this was out at the Grace Museum. Yeah, I, um, I had put this one in here because the piece that you have is actually of part of this family. Uh, these were the five pieces that were on the opposite wall of the Mac show. So these were the first five large pieces I did. Um, and, uh, but they're of that kind of same spirit uh, and time of, uh, of there. I wanted yeah, and, to leave your last yeah. slide in because I wanted to hear you talk about this. So in terms of influences, um, you know, Velasquez, of course, he's, you know, he is a painting, you know, demigod, right? And I, and this painting on the right, Portrait of Dorothy, it's actually at the, the Dallas Museum of Art. So I've seen it many times. And it was a painting that when um, I was asked to do a copy of a, of a painting, I chose to do a copy of this. Now, this isn't my copy. Unfortunately, the copy I did, someone um, really wanted to buy it before I ever um, took a picture of it. But I have these two here because both Velasquez and Sargent I think the reason they're so interesting to me is the Velasquez, when I see this painting at the Met, I look at it and I always feel as though I'm, you know, I understand, like, I know this person, like there's some really strong specificity, something's captured an essence, right, of, of Juan. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, he's more alive to me than people around me, but at the same time, I can focus on the lace on his collar and 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 it's unfortunate i don't have a detail but you know it literally is just a blob right so i can see the stroke and i can see the paint mm -hmm. and with sergeant so this is something i i ask you know i tell students you know what do you always seem interested in work because with sergeant it was the same thing that it's very specific and very loose so this portrait of dorothy um you could say it's kind of a quick study but it has everything you need and there are areas that are just so like almost shouldn't work, but they do, right? There's almost just empty, like like the feathers on the top, they're just wiped off. You know, the but hats. It's very yeah. akin to your comment about that yellow circle mm -hmm. that, you know, you may or may not keep it, but right. once you arrive at that instant where you recognize that this is enough, this is finished, right. uh, it might be through a series of, you know, spontaneity or, um, we have a sergeant up right now, and I was really struck with the edge of a book that the subject is holding. It's nothing more than a few brush strokes. They're formally brush strokes, and yet mm -hmm. they're representative. I mean, Deborah, when I go to museums and I see sergeants and certain artists that have, you know, paint in, in a manner similar to him, I will take so many details of those areas to then show students. It's like, look, you guys, you know, look at this hand. It's four strokes and nothing. But yet it's right relative to everything yeah. else. And that's really the key that nothing is right or wrong. It's really relative to everything else, whether it works or doesn't work in this case. So, you know, as a teacher, that's something that um, I'm always trying to kind of share with my students that, you know, I can't tell you, you know, either what to paint or what is the way to do what you want to do? Because there's an infinite number of ways, right? But I can help you when you're going off track and I can give you, you know, suggestions of different ways. And if you know what you think you want to do, I can, you know, help you technically kind of to get there. But, but sometimes you, you know, you'll know it when you see it and there are definitely more than one way, so. And sometimes you change one thing and it changes everything. And it might yes. be for the better and it might take you on a whole new trajectory. I loved that about Jasper Johns that he said, change mm -hmm. it and then change it again. And it becomes something altogether different. Um, it's true for installation. You deal with it in your own work. You yeah. can change it, you can rearrange it and it mm -hmm. becomes something wholly anew and different. Yeah, I mean, that's probably one of the main things that it's all relative yeah. in painting. Yeah. Well, do you think that, uh, that we have uh, an opportunity for art uh, coming from this time forward to do some things that it's never done before or to be a renewal uh, of spirit or what do you what are your thoughts about this time? 
Well, I mean, I think that in a way, nothing's ever totally new and yet everything is always new because each person's an individual. So each person brings something new, right? A new interpretation of maybe these older archetypal, you know, ideas. Um, so I do see more variety in expressions nowadays, which I admire. And maybe, you know, going back to something you said at the very beginning about, you know, being the only Latina in the room. Um, you know, I do feel like not having had seen, I mean, I think one of the things I was fighting against was being told you must, you know, be this or be that. And now I see that it's almost anything goes. And in a way that's so exciting, I think not just for the artists, but for the viewers. Right, because it may be that you know you find something new that you didn't think you'd like or that you didn't, you didn't think you'd understand, but it makes sense in a weird way. And that's something I would encourage not just artists but viewers that it's okay, it's actually normal to have eclectic taste, right? I mean, you, you can appreciate something and not want to do, do it yourself necessarily, but you can appreciate, you know, think about what you appreciate about it. Um, and you know, spend time looking at it. So I think that there is um, a lot of exciting new voices out there and a lot of variety of work to see. So um, I think it's an exciting time in that respect. I will, I will echo that because I think um, there's been a lot of time to sort of slow down mm -hmm. and yet people are maybe, um, looking back and also to the future at the same time. And I think that there is an opportunity to really look uh, maybe more deeply, maybe um, for the first time. So I just wanna thank you for sharing. I feel like we could talk for hours and hours and your work does the same, absolutely the same. Um, more is more and you've really <laughs> shown that today. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you so much, Deborah, for having me. And hopefully, uh, you know, we can, uh, I can get down to, to Texas sometime soon. So, well, you, this is your home. So you'll be back and please come, please come south. We want to have you here. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Lillian.